everybody. I'm Ellie Shore, and I've been doing Art Salon for two and a half years now. And every time is different. Every artist is so different. And the kinds of projects that artists get involved in are so different. And I look for a variety of people who have very different stories to tell. And this is certainly going to be one of them. Subject of national parks is a hugely fascinating subject. And Steve Horan has been going out to Yellowstone for many years. He has a brother who lives there and had been a portrait photographer in Toronto for many years and now here, and a commercial photographer, and became interested in the people who live in Yellowstone who are making a difference, people who are activists, people who are environmentalists, people who are working in various parts of the complexity of that huge space. It's my pleasure to introduce Steve Horan. Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Horan. I'm a photographer. And uh, I've been doing this project for five years. And it's been a passion of mine to go out to Yellowstone for 30 years. And this project came up five years ago. This is a poster that was done for a one-day show in Gardner, Montana. Gardner is a, a special place because it's right outside the arch in Yellowstone. And it's also the hub for the Yellowstone Association, which tells people about what is going on in Yellowstone in a nature way. Uh, it has a lot of biologists working for them, people that know so much and are willing to give it and show people what is happening. Now, my pictures are environmental portraitures, which actually says something about what these people do and where they're located. And they all have stories that are very unique for this area. The idea actually came from my brother. His name is Jim, who I visited out in Yellowstone in 1984. He came out of college in the county major, and he wanted to adventure out after college. So he decided to go across the country, and he found out about Yellowstone. He got a summer job there, and I visited him out in Yellowstone, and I was totally amazed, and he fell in love with it. Now, the thing is with Jimmy, it's a story that's heard over and over again because people change their lives to move out there, to experience it, to be there a week, two weeks, three weeks for a lifetime. And Jimmy is a perfect example of that. He came up with the idea of Yellowstone, people of Yellowstone. He has an inside track on that because he's a book distributor in Yellowstone National Park. He's been doing that for 13 years. But also, he's a big major hiker. He hikes all over the world. He also hikes, uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, called the Pacific Crest Trail, which runs from Mexico to Canada, all on the West Coast. There's also another trail that he's experienced, and it's an incredible trail. It runs from Mexico up to Canada. It's 3,100 miles. And Jimmy did this in 1998 over a period of five months straight through. 3,100 miles through land that is mountainous, desert, anything that you want to describe through the United States, it's there. It's a challenging, challenging course or park or trail. And what happens is it goes through Yellowstone. Now, one of the things that I want to say about this project in each of these pictures, everybody has a story, but it also pertains to Yellowstone and Yellowstone ecosystem. So when you look at a photograph, you're going to say, what's their story? What's going on here? What am I going to learn about this special person, this special place? Now, here on the lower mid-bottom, there is the trail that goes in through the park. And it's one of the most areas, it's the Beckler region, that is the most remote area in the lower 48 of the United States. So there's ranger cabins in that area. But if you get hurt, you're on your own. You better be with somebody that you can trust and an emergency can depend on. That's a lot of things that people learn out west and in the wilderness 
is that you have to be self-reliant. And if you're not self-reliant, then why are you going in there? It's dangerous. All right? So be prepared. Know what you're doing. Know where you're going. Tell somebody where you're going. And enjoy. Now, <laughs> to the right is my brother, Jimmy. You notice that he's got uh, beads on. <laughs> he's a happy guy. Uh, but uh, also, he's got bear spray. And they are just entering Yellowstone National Park through the trail of the Continental Divide Trail, that's called. All right, and that's his friend Mark. He travels with him on all its, uh, he did the Pacific Crest Trail with him and the Continental Divide Trail. It's always the best bet to be traveling in pairs or three people when you're going into backcountry. It's unsafe to go by yourself. Now, here's a sample of the trail in Yellowstone National Park. Well, when they did this uh, trail, it was in 1998. That was 10 years after the Yellowstone fires, which was a real eye-opener on how fast fires can destroy wilderness. Uh, it, it destroyed over 30% of the park, burned over 30% of the park. And there was structures that were burnt. And a uh, matter of fact, Old Faithful Inn was almost burned down because of it. And they still let people in the park. That was the incredible thing that was happening. That is the picture of my brother on the Continental Divide Trail and his story that will say about his adventures, about his experiences, and his love for nature and hiking and people that are around here. He has so many friends. They all share a love for the place and the people in Yellowstone. Sometimes people meet, they haven't seen each other for 10 years, and, and I've seen it happen where they act like it's almost yesterday that they talk to each other. There's a real bond here, and that's what's so special about this place and so special about the people there. Now, I just wanted to talk about the uh, process of, of doing the uh, portraits. I've been asked a lot of times of how I select people for this project. I've had over 100 photographs uh, for this project and spend five years, and, and I go out there like five or six months at a time. It's a very uh, labor-intensive work because um, it's all about getting the proper subjects, people in front of the camera and the story. There's a lot of people that hike, but I don't want to show pictures of people just hiking all the time. That's not interesting to me. It's not interesting to people that be, want to know about different aspects of the park or the Yellowstone ecosystem. So. My initial people that I selected for the project were people that were, were known in the local communities. And so that I selected them, once I've got them in front of the camera, that I could drop their name. And then other people might follow. I also had recommendations. It was very strong. Again, my brother's connections or my connections that I generated over 30 years of going out there. And um, people knew my name um, and my friendship. It was also the word of mouth. Um, I would be talking about the project constantly. <laughs> I go anywhere, I would be talking about it, because I never knew where I would get a connection. People out there are, are, are always thinking about nature. A lot of people are. Uh, they're connected to it. It's right outside their door. Actually, you can go outside uh, where Jimmy lives in Livingston, Montana, 10 minutes away, and you can go on a trail, and, and a trail you will not see anybody the whole day. It's amazing. Uh, and that's part of the Yellowstone ecosystem. Now, uh, again, it was word of mouth, uh, research, reading the newspapers, looking at the TV, or talking to people. Uh, research is part of going to the coffee shop and talking again. And then luck, <laughs> just falling into the right situation and uh, finding somebody that works or lives or does something very interesting in the park and you just happen to be talking to them. Sometimes uh, phone calls work, but it's a, a lot of things out there are, are worked, are not. Uh, communication, you go to Yellowstone for a lot of times to not have communication. There are zones out there, no service on your phone, no service, no internet, no TV. Wow. So that's why people go out there. So texting. A number of times. First of all, they don't use. So a lot of people don't use email. No use for it. And if they do have it, they don't check it. Right? 
texting, what's that? You know, or not, I'm only being, <laughs> okay, it's, they're not, everybody's sophisticated out there. It's very intelligent people, all right? So, but it's not the place for gadgets in a lot of ways. Then uh, I would set up, uh, I would talk to somebody they might be interested in it over the phone or in person, and then we'd, I'd just lay the seed and just talk about the project, and then we do an in initial interview where we think maybe they're interested in it. And then uh, we set up another meeting, and then because we, we want to make a stake statement with the photo. And so we have to make it uh, germinate. The idea have to germinate. All right, so we have another meeting after that, and that's when we collaborate. And that's when I got to know the person a little better, that I would be able to come up with my own ideas, and then we would sit down and talk and swap, swap ideas. And then once we have that idea, I would go scatter location, drive, drive, drive. Time of day is so important. Location is so important. And then we have to coordinate our efforts because when I'm on the project for five months, I'm dealing with people that have a, a, a work frame of five months. And they have to work their butts off to make a living. So they're very, very busy people. And I'm getting in their way to take a portrait. And a lot of people don't want their portrait taken. Uh, it's a very hard thing for a lot of people to do. But that's why I'm so very, very thankful for when people do get in front of the camera that I can take their portrait and we can work together to create something special for me and them and tell a story at the same time. Right? So, and then we get to the photo shoot. And I'm a happy guy when we get there because that is what I've worked for weeks to get to. I mean, it's on average, if it took five years, I've had about 100 pictures, over a little over 100 pictures. So we're talking about one picture every two weeks on average. So this is not going, hi, call you up and say, let's do something. It's not that way at all. And I just want to stress that there's a lot of work involved in here. Now, this is about wildlife on the roads. And that's what Yellowstone is all about, because you can drive in your car, and you can see wildlife, elk, wolf, buffalo, coyote, anything, if you get lucky. There's buffalo jams. There's elk jams. There's goat jams. There's people want to see it. That's what they come for. Now, I, have, I showed you this picture, because this is uh, it's something that you might see while you're driving along in Yellowstone. Buffalo on the road. And if you're going too fast, this picture, you might kill an animal. But this picture is, has a lot of meaning for me because I did see somebody, I was doing 45 miles per hour in Yellowstone. That's the miles per, you have to go. And an SUV went past me doing about 60. And two minutes later, I saw around the bend a buffalo in the middle of the road, dead and the car about 150 feet down. And the center of it was smashed in. The driver was OK. But it was careless driving. And I worked with uh, Beth Cruiser, who was a backcountry ranger. She'd been going to Yellowstone for a, a long time, on her own time, because she was a homicide detective in Houston, Texas, for 20 years. So she has cred to be in this picture Morning symbolizing this picture was lit by headlights in Yellowstone on a road with an interpretive skull borrowed from the uh, museum there, just kind of contemplating what could be the life of this animal if it wasn't slaughtered on the road. Uh, there's actually 100 animals killed, mammals, large mammals killed every year in Yellowstone. So anyway, I wanted to put a message through there. Not uh, a joyous one, but something that needs to be said. And that's what the project is all about. It needs to be said. A lot of things need to be said. And, and uh, that's one of them. Uh, I wanted to capture the spirit of people whose lives and work centered in Yellowstone National Park and surrounding Ye Yellowstone ecosystem. That's what's, it's, it's a world uh, iconic place. No place like this anywhere. There has been no project done like this for this area, ever.
people, when they said to me, when I pre presented them, uh, I presented them a booklet of snapshots that I've done or work that I've done, and they said, people that connect, they say, good idea, great idea. It's contemporary history now uh, that is so important in the future generations. What we do now affects what will happen later. Here is uh, one shot, uh, me in action, uh, on a photo shoot, almost getting trampled by a horse. <laughs> but I'm focusing. But, um, or I didn't hear it, but I didn't care because I'm so intense on what I wanted to capture. Now, uh, this gentleman uh, that I'm um, photographing, his name is Jet Hitt. He works out of Gardner. It's uh, Yellowstone Wilderness Outfitters. He's a very successful outfitter. And that's the shot that came from that. I wanted to connect him to his pack mules, or a special breed of animals that he has, that he takes people out for a week, 10 days. And he's somebody that takes out naturalists with them. He does, he's not an outfitter that goes now, hunting for animals, they go and look at them and photograph them. He also happens to be a concerto writer. And so there's many layers to the people in, in these areas. Um, and also, uh, that's what I found fascinating, absolutely fascinating, uh, to be a, an outfitter, successful, and then PhD in concertos, writing concerto symphonies. And this is uh, an area, this is similar to what they would be doing. Uh, if this, this might be them, I'm not sure if it is, they're uh, Yellowstone wild, Wildlife Outfitters. Uh, this gentleman, Jeff Henry. I actually met him the second last day that I was going to leave Yellowstone this year. Uh, I had been trying to get a hold of him for the last two years, health issues, back and forth, distances and everything like that. He's an author. And uh, he wrote a book on Old Faithful Inn with uh, uh, Karen Reinhardt, partner at the time. And so uh, I said, Jeff, we got to do something. I met him in the Old Faithful Inn lobby. Yeah, what are we going to do? Well, let's think on it. We slept on it, and we had coffee in the morning. And I said, ah, Jeff, now, what's going on? Because he's in winter. I don't do any winter scenes except my brother. <laughs> and we went to the mountain. But he told me when we were having coffee, that, oh, I have my tools with me. They're down in the shed. They are? Let's go there. It's a historic shed. These tools, he is a winter keeper. He is somebody that protects the roofs, takes the snow off the roofs of buildings in Yellowstone National Park. Because if the snow stays on the roof, they collapse. And I'll give you a sample of this right now. That's the heavy duty snow right there, all right? Now you can get an idea of what he does right there. <laughs> now, if you look at that saw uh, that he has there, we just go back, and those are those tools, all his tools on the left-hand side. I believe that's the tool right there that he was cutting, uh, that uh, seven or eight foot tall length of snow that uh, look in a very precarious position, <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> so, that's Jeff, and that's what he's doing, getting the snow off the roof. Whoa. And sometimes, uh, he said, that these blocks of snow are three or 400 pounds. Very dangerous, and sometimes you need help to get them off. And it doesn't look like the ground is too far away, because it isn't. The snow is up like 12 feet. <laughs> it's just crazy there during the winter. And here we go. Here's another workman. All right? So this is Fred. And this is, was a very rare occasion. I met Fred on that day photographing. I was photographing somebody else. And I saw this gentleman come in with a 16-wheeler put it into a barn, and there was 100 horses at the Canyon Ranch. And uh, that's not him. That's not Fred climbing up, the younger guy. Uh, but Fred is the driver of that truck. And he's been working for different, uh, now he was working for Zantara. They, they, they're the corporation that has the uh, rights to work in the uh, Yellowstone. He's been working in there 37 years. 
And I call this photograph tough enough because he was hauling around these things. He's like 63 years old at the time. He's hauling around these bales. He's getting up there. He's way up in the top of their barn, throwing them around, getting it done. Now you go back. That's a 16 wheel that he's, that he's, that's the bed that's cleaned off. And the whole barn on the left hand side is filled now with hay. Now there's a truck going out in the back with hay, feeding the horses out. And it happened to be a foggy day, which is perfect for a photographer. This is photographer day. All right, so that's Fred. And this is the person that I came, Stacy, to photograph. Now, Besides being an extraordinary and beautiful woman, she is, uh, the title is a wrangler. She's been worked, worked around horses all her life. And what, uh, she worked there five years ago, and uh, she was doing uh, different uh, jobs, and then they, had, they called her up, and they liked her work five years, and she came back like that. And she, what she does is take people back into she, uh, trail rides. Uh, tourists back into trail rides and, and, and talk to them during the day. And then they come back and they take care of the horses. She knows horses. This is her life. Now, here's another gentleman. It's, we're talking about working people. This is uh, Warren Johnson. A house, uh, the, this is a barn that he built. Uh, they have over 100 horses. He's a different uh, type of outfitter. He's a hunter. And he takes people uh, to uh, tail roaring outfitters. Uh, they take them to an area outside the park and um, harvest animals. They, uh, they hunt them. They kill them. They use their meat, antlers, and they're very good at what they do. And he's a very proud man, a very uh, self-made man. And um, those, those horseshoes are from the horses that he owns, very proud family man. And uh, when I shook his hand, you look at those hands, the working man's hands, it was like going into a cashier's mitt. <laughs> it was great. Uh, yeah, uh, Warren, Warren Johnson. Uh, you can tell that he's very proud. Here's another proud person. Uh, this is Loretta. And she's another uh, person that goes into the outfitters, goes into the back country. And what Loretta does is, the, is this is called Cookie. She was called Cookie, but I really, um, she has a great sense of humor, very independent. And uh, she would be the only woman with 12 hunters in a camp for 10 days at a time. And they would hike into these camps with 20 horses. And she would have all the supplies, and she'd be the only cook there. So she's kind of tough. And she's also a gourmet cook and also has her own restaurant. Um, so very intelligent and an artist. Many layers. Now uh, here is uh, Bill Berg. He um, was a winter keeper for nine years. And in 1990, I believe, uh, he thought uh, he worked out of a, a phone booth starting a company called Coolworks. And he thought it might be a great idea for other people to work in areas that are fantastic, national parks. So he, this is the first office that he had, and it's actually his home on Yellowstone. And he's just, uh, he's holding a pen that he likes to, uh, like a magic wand, when somebody gets a job and he knows you're going to be good at it, he taps the paper and says, all right. Just a blessing. <coughs> just a blessing. He's also, uh, Bill is also very uh, involved in uh, not only business, but in the community, president of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the politics of everything that you want to be somebody. And there's Jojo. This uh, portrait, she uh, works for the uh, National Park Service, and, and she's called, uh, it's a can-do photograph. And that's what a lot of National Park Service people are. They, they can do it. They want to do it, and they're rare for a reason, because they love the outdoors. And um, this is just the Rosie Riveter pose that we all know so well. Uh, this is Doug Smith. 
Now, this was an interesting, this, he's almost like the rock star of uh, biologists for wolves. And um, this was taken down in the Lamar Valley uh, at the Buffalo Ranch. And my brother and myself were invited there because Jimmy was good friends with Doug. I didn't know Doug personally. And we were invited to, because he had no time for posing we, a meeting, we were there for a seminar, a two-day seminar. We just stayed one day for his talks that he was giving there. Besides myself listening to him, they also had the BBC crew looking at his every move and uh, uh, shadowing him. And so I was asking to do a portrait of him in between takes, in between classes. He would come out. First, we did with wolf skin. Then I had him holding the skull and then Bing! Why not put them two together? And then I didn't have all those things draped around it. And it's a little different when you have a, a wolf skin draped around him. And I asked, I, and this is, a, I, I think it was a real compliment to me as far as getting somebody to trust me. I said, Doug, is this okay to put this wolf skin around you? He said, sure. So there it is. And, and, and Doug, He's well known, so that was the first year, and that was a real a feather in my cap to drop his name, and other people will follow as far as maybe being in the portraits. Another person that changed their lives work, uh, Wendy, uh, this is recycler, good at what she does, and uh, back of a garbage truck, <laughs> recycling truck. But she was also going during the weekends, she would uh, be helping people clear trails. This is uh, Judge Stephen Call. I was very, very fortunate to meet that gentleman. And I speak in past tense because he did pass away uh, shortly uh, a year after this photograph was taken. But this was in Judge Chambers. He was the federal magistrate of Yellowstone National Park for 31 years. He did not like his photograph being taken. He doesn't smile. That's what he told me the first thing. <laughs> and, but he was gracious enough because, you know what, uh, he said, uh, I'm doing this for others. And it was for his niece that he loved. I uh, gave him those photographs and he just, he just loved them. Here's um, Mary Klein. She works in the gift shop. Uh, she's been there, a gift shop manager, but she also, and this illustrates the sports that they do at uh, Yellowstone. And uh, this is disc golf. Anybody knows disc golf? This is you throw a disc at a certain point, and it's just like the scoring and, and golf game. And uh, she was the champion for three years running. That's why she's there. Lee Whittlesley, he's the uh, National Park Service uh, historian. And uh, this is the looking back into the past. And this is in Gardner in a graveyard that is in Yellowstone National Park. This happens to be. Um, Bob Barbie. He was a superintendent of Yellowstone National Park during the 1988 fires. He agreed to sit in front of a fire because at the time of those fires, they called it Bob's Barbecue because of the way it was handled. Uh, they, everybody thought it was, uh, but he actually walked into a perfect storm. Dry weather, drought conditions, windy, and they had a policy of putting out fires all the time. So what happened, in the combustible material, wood gathered in large amounts. And when it, when it ignited, it flared and burnt everything. But he's now sitting in front of a fire because he actually talks about saying the policy changes after that. They, they let fires burn now until or, to a certain extent. This is a photograph. Um, this is in the Boiling River in uh, Mammoth Hot Springs, and that's a Shia. And she, uh, this has to do with a lot of people come to Yellowstone or nature to heal. There's a lot of things that happen to people's lives and they go out to nature and try to heal themselves. And a Shia Mills is just one of those people. And she's a snow coach driver, a teacher, and now she's a mother. Apparently she was just a, uh, become pregnant as uh, before this photograph was taken, and it's called Grateful. This is Boiling River because the hot water from Mammoth Hot Springs joins to 
a snow runoff in the Gardner River. And at that point, it's a public swimming area. Uh, so you can enjoy yourself there. Uh, but uh, she's an amazing person. And this is the uh, good Reverend Bill Young in the uh, Mammoth Chapel, 100-year chapel. It was commissioned for $25,000 to build in 1914. This is uh, Chuck Preston. He's, this is in Cody, Wyoming. That's a live golden eagle, a captive golden eagle, that they have a raptor uh, program that they show people. And by the way, that beak is used to rip flesh <laughs> off of animals. And uh, Chuck is standing really close. He's a very positive guy and uh, very commanding guy and very inspirational. He's actually the person that I, last year, uh, 2013, I thought I was finished photography. And I showed my work to, he's a curator of the Draper Museum, which is the part of the Buffalo Bill Cody Museum, Buffalo Bill Center of the West, an amazing museum, five acres of work uh, of Buffalo Bill's life, uh, Yellowstone Ecosystem Natural History, and he is the curator of the Natural History Museum, and he's the one that uh, inspired other people to put it together. He inspired me to come out there. This is Bob Coe. This is the Buffalo Bill Cody uh, Pahoski TP, and uh, this is symbolic, and um, they saved this place for a number of years uh, from fire, and uh, he's, this is a National Historic Building and he agreed to throw water in it for the photo. Detail? <laughs> OK, detail. So you had a hole in the, in the uh, skull of the buffalo. Uh, that's for, they take the brains out, and they use it for tanning material uh, in the hide. So it's an official. OK, and a naturalist uh, in a wolf den. <laughs> OK, so we're getting uh, very symbolic here. Conceptual, artsy. I love it. Again, this is a, a, a biologist, John Varley. He's the one that uh, shouted out that there's an invasive species in Yellowstone Lake. Uh, it actually devastated the Yellowstone cutthroat trout, which was used for many animals, uh, species. Anyway, it's very symbolic. Again, uh, somebody, he's a tree ring reader, John King, acting like a tree, a juniper. That's what he does. He, he, he measures climate. Uh, what happened, a 1,500-year-old tree has imprints in its core telling us what went on in the climate. And that's uh, Larry. It's for uh, kindred spirits, and he protects buffalo from drivers when they come in and migrate from West Yellowstone to Madison. And this is uh, American Gothic Silvergate, uh, two artists that actually, uh, they built that home. And they stood up to mining inter interests uh, that in 1990s put a uh, coalition together and joined other coalitions to stop the mine. And uh, they were lived in a mining town. So they weren't friendly to a lot of people at the time. Uh, they stood up. And that's what being, just doing what you believe in. And this is uh, Grant Bulltail. Uh, he was at a, a ceremony. We talked about the photo doing him. It's a peace ceremony. And he's the one that uh, did, the, did the whole ceremony. The project, I believe, is going to be going national. And it's going to have a book uh, to go with it. It's going to be a black and white portrait, as you've seen, and a story. Uh, that's going to go deeper into the subject so people can know about it. It's how I hope that people connect to Yellowstone. This is the, the writer that's going to be a wonderful writer, uh, Ruth Crocker, that already has a book out uh, just recently. And uh, she's won awards, and uh, I'm looking forward to her writing. Okay, see some of the people, the organizations that I've been involved with in uh, Yellowstone. And uh, by the way, I have to give a big shout out to thank you for all my subjects in the book, because they took the time and they trusted me immensely with their image. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.